Listen, a voice is sounding, Christ is near. We hear it say, cast away your dealings of darkness, all you children of the day. Shaken by the solemn warning, out from the shadows we arise. Christ the Son, all ill dispelling, shines upon the dawning sky. Come and see in awe and wonder the word has silent been and with the blast of thunder his majesty he proclaimed a voice is sounding loud Christ is here, Christ is here, a voice is sounding loud, Christ is here, Christ is here. See the Lamb so long awaited comes with pardon down above let us haste in tears and sorrow to receive his benevolent love when he comes again in glory and the world is wrapped in fear he will shield us with his mercy and in love will draw us near come and see come and see in awe and wonder the word has silent beam and with a blast of thunder his majesty he sounding loud Christ is here Christ is here a voice is sounding loud Christ is here Christ is here a voice is sounding loud Christ is here Christ is here a voice is sounding loud Christ is here Christ is here. Come and see. Come and see in all and wonder the word as silent being. And with a blast of thunder, His majesty He proclaimed. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Ebenezer Mennonite Church this morning. And I would ask you to grab the bulletin, take a look at that real quick. Uh, just a heads up that immediately after... Uh, service, we're going to have a little appreciation time for Dick Potter and Cheryl as, as he's going to be officially retiring at the end of the year. We want to thank them for their service and all the good things he's brought. On the inside, just keep an eye on the idea that the Faith Promise Commitments, which is our means of supplying the missionaries that we support around the world, 50-some uh, missionaries, we are closing in on the goal of $325,000. Uh, I just ask that you would uh, consider uh, upping your gift or adding a gift uh, to uh, meet that need. Also, just want to bring to your attention 
Um, the Bible reading for next year, the intent is to read through the Bible again, whether in a chronological means or just uh, from the beginning to end, or we'll have a different uh, reading opportunities for you. We'll be reading the ESV, the English Standard Version, and I would invite you to get a copy of that if you don't have one. Uh, I found a very interesting copy of the ESV. It's called the Reader's Edition. That's the one I'm going to be reading. Uh, the chapters and verses and the little headings that are added in are not included. It just reads like a book. It's more like it was written at the time. So you can find the ESV Reader's Version out there. It's quite affordable. Also, lastly, the church directory. We're getting close to the picture-taking time so we can put all of our pictures in a directory. Please, uh, if you haven't, a sign up for that. We would love to have your smiling face in that directory along with your name and uh, the other pertinent things so we know who you are. So with that, Jeremy Lemley, one of the deacons, is going to pray this morning. Good morning. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord, a day that we are able to come together with this body, those here in person and watching at home. Lord, we ask that you would be with those that are sick and unable to be here in attendance today. Lord, be with the members of our congregation as we have our upcoming annual meeting where we will elect people to serve here at Ebenezer. Help us to seek your will with these decisions as Ebenezer continues to serve our local mission field. Lord, I thank you for Pastor Potter and his leadership and especially his God-given gift of compassion, his desire to counsel those in need, and for his impact on the ministry of Ebenezer. Lord, I ask that you go before Dick and Cheryl as they enter into this next phase of life. May you continue to be their guide. Lord, I thank you for the Christmas season, a time of reflection and celebration. Lord, be with those who are going to, to experience a different kind of Christmas this year due to the loss of a loved one or other life situations that could impact the joy that is typically experienced this time of year. During this time of busyness, may we remember the true reason for the season, the birth of your son, who would, through his crucifixion, give us the best gift of all, salvation. Heavenly Father, be with Nick and speak through him to draw us closer to you through his message today. Thank you again, Father, for our Ebenezer family. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, we are Doug and Mary Lou Anthony, and we are with Walk in Two Worlds. And our ministry is mostly in the unreached parts of the world, particularly in the 1040 window. And our home base is in North Carolina. We believe that arts matter for ministry and mission, and that local arts speak best to local hearts. So we gather musicians and artists together with local ministry leaders in these unreached places. And, uh, and it's our joy to see them talk strategy and discover that local arts and local artists can help advance ministry and to accomplish ministry goals that were not possible before. So we, fa we facilitate many different kinds of projects, but uh, today you get to see an update from a scripture song project in Zambia just earlier this year. <laughs> So you are Tokale. Yes, ma'am. What is it like for you at this point of your life to hear Tokale scripture now put in song? What is that like? It is amazing because you talk the typical language of my lair and I understand it very well. <laughs> We are grateful uh, for Douglas and Mary. You've seen this is the first time in the history of Senga tribe. It's the first time to sing, to have our own song 
from the Bible. It's the first time. We founded this ministry because the arts matter. You see, culture is the most intuitive means of connection that we have. And in much of the world, it is a primary means of connection. And so we're joining you here from uh, Mfue, Zambia. On we're location. On location. And you can hear the choirs around us, the groups that are uh, composing new songs. These are scripture memory songs. So the Kunda Bible translation will not be delivered to the people for another year. It's got a series of uh, proofs and then final printing. Uh, but in the meantime, we've been invited to come and uh, help people create songs in the Kunda, using the Kunda Bible translation, word for word scripture, not only in their own spoken language, but in their own musical language. So this is something new for them because the churches have their own musical languages and it doesn't speak to the hearts of the people outside the church. One woman said after our time together, she said, I always knew God saw the Kunda. Now I know he hears the Kunda. That's powerful. Very, very powerful. And another pastor uh, said after his team's music teams got back from our time together, they, they uh, changed all of their songs into their mother tongue. And the pastor said, the church came alive. Came alive. Powerful words. As far as prayer requests, we ask that you would pray that we could continue to innovate in the field with our work, that we would be able to inspire and equip local artists on the field, as well as inspire a younger generation uh, who would pick up the baton and follow us in our steps. And uh, we pray and pray that God will allow us to influence mission strategies around the world as well. And I also, we also invite you to pray for us. Uh, we have had to suspend our travel for the next few months. Um, on June 17th, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Praise the Lord, it's caught early, but it still needs to be dealt with. So I'll be facing some uh, surgeries, treatments afterwards. Um, uh, so anyway, just, just pray for us. I'm absolutely confident that God walks this journey with us and that he will give us everything that we need and the courage to face all that is coming. This yeah, way. so pray for wisdom so we know what decision needs to be made. Pray for courage that we could make the decision and walk in it and pray for peace that we would have over us the entire process. And we know that God's um, not surprised by this diagnosis and that his plans for us are not thwarted at all, that he had this all factored in. Uh, so we're going to, going to continue forward and we'll do whatever he allows us to do. With joy. Yes, in this chapter. So thank you for your prayers and for your financial support um, through this whole ministry. What a perfect segue, with joy. Uh, I think as those folks sang, could you not see their joy? Could you hear their joy? And these songs are new to them, but uh, you know that might become their amazing grace or their um, great is thy faithfulness, whatever it is. So folks, uh, glad you're here this morning. Let's learn from that. Let's stand. We are going to sing Joy to the World. And uh, you know, as the 1040 window there, as they share, Joy to the World, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. Yeah, that's your heart here in Northwest Ohio, but it's also their heart, and it's the heart in China and, and worldwide. So let's say hello to our neighbor. We're going to sing a Joy to the World and O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and Rejoice.
come, Emmanuel, and let's sing a rejoice when we get to that chorus. be seated. And uh, Kara is going to lead us. Uh, she's going to uh, do How Great Thou Art in a great version. And uh, please be blessed this morning.
God is indeed great, and that's something to rejoice over. This morning, if you have your Bible, we're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 30 and 31. As we get there, I'd like to just ask that God would be with us as we study together. Father, we thank you for bringing us here. We thank you uh, for opportunity to lift our voices and praise you. We thank you for the opportunity to dig into your word, that we would come to know you better, that our hearts would be uh, fixed in a way that we continually turn to you. We thank you for giving us the words that we have as we consider people around the world who are just getting the word in their language for the first time. 
Uh, we have so much to be thankful for. So I just pray now this morning that you would uh, take your word and impact it into our hearts in a way that uh, would change us. We trust you to do that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. This nice, brisk morning uh, was interesting to go out and find frost on the windows of the truck and uh, have to warm it up a little bit before I got here. Causes me to think back to my days in Alaska. I did spend a number of years in central Alaska out in, uh, well, where it got really cold. And uh, so my mind was kind of turning toward Alaska this week. And I was reminded of a a hunting trip that me and my dad and uh, my brother and some other men went out. And we we went... um, we fl- actually, it was above the Arctic Circle. We hunted for 10 days. It was torturous at times. Um, we survived mostly, and there was broken bones. There were broken vehicles. It was a typical Alaska trip. And as we were coming uh, down the hall road, and we had finally got to civilization and ate food that we hadn't cooked over a fire in 10 days, we were feeling pretty good. And we got on the road and heading back uh, to Anchorage from the Fairbanks area, uh, which is up north. And as we were heading down, uh, our, our kind of our guide, a good friend of mine who had led us on this hunting trip and had been a friend of mine a long time, uh, insisted that we pull the car over beside the road. And we were just ready to get home, you know, in our own beds. And, and we pulled over to the side of the road and and he says, I want, you get something today that you almost never get. What you get today is you get to see something that is rare. And we got out, we're looking around, and he, he points off into the distance. And the, the, the ter- terrain there is largely flat. And he points out into the distance. And out in the distance, uh, we can see a, there's a mountain out there, like, whoopie do mountains are everywhere in Alaska right but he's like you need to look at that mountain and um, I'm like yeah that's that's good no no you need to take a picture of that mountain because this view is is uniquely rare I'm like okay dad take take a picture we stand there cheesing up right and I I said so what's so special about it he says you don't realize that that mountain is more than 200 miles away I'm like, what? No, that, that mountain's 200, plus 200 mile, miles away. That's like me walking out into the parking lot out there and saying, you see that mountain in Illinois over there? That's what it would have been like. I'm like, oh, okay, that's, that's interesting. But what really got interesting was the next, <laughs> the next four and a half hours of driving only to watch that mountain grow and grow, and grow, and four hours later, we're at the base of Mount McKinley. That mountain was massive, but from 200 miles away, we didn't realize it was the, you know, you couldn't tell it was the highest peak from 200 miles away, the highest peak in North America, but thankfully, our guide gave us an indication that we were looking at that peak from that distance. Jeremiah 30 and 31, I think maybe that mountain, that giant mountain of Scripture that from a long way off, he's saying, I'm going to show you something. that you, It doesn't look that big right now, but I'm going to show you something that as you travel down the road, you're going to see that this is the mountain. This is the peak. This is the thing that you need to be aware of in all of Scripture. Jeremiah 31, I believe, 30 and 31, is preparing us to see that which is coming in the distance. In chapter 30, I mean, obviously, we've got more material than we're going to be able to get done in a short time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of set the stage with chapter 30. And then we're going to jump into chapter 31. But in chapter 30, Jeremiah is hearing the word of the Lord, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Quote, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, write in all, write in a book all the words I have spoken to you. For behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, 
when I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will bring them back to the land that I gave their fathers, and they shall take possession of it. Just a very simple synopsis of what's coming. That's, that's the synopsis of the next couple chapters. And in chapter 30, what we're going to see is we're going to be able to draw out some things that are built within that synopsis. We're going to see some things that are, have been brought to the table before. And he's just going to highlight them. And I'm just going to point them out as we go. We're going to see some things in here. We're going to see the fact that the promise is to Israel and Judah now. And if you're aware of when this is, is about 590 B.C., five, between that and 586 B.C., to think of the fact that Israel, it was 722 B.C., and Israel was gone off into the Assyrian captivity and didn't return. So when God says the promise in this change is going to happen for Israel and Judah, it would catch their attention. Like, wait a second. Israel's gone. I don't even know that they, where they were in existence. Judah was at the brink of going into captivity. So we're going to see that God is expanding. We start seeing the mountain grow just a little bit of the promise. Wow, Israel and Judah, that's interesting. In verse 4, and the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. So he's, he's saying, I want you to be aware something is a little bit different in this type of prophecy. And then throughout these next several verses, what he's going to talk about is he's going to talk about the pain and the struggle that the people of God had gone through. Much of it was self-inflicted. Much of it was, if you don't make a change, you're going to get the punishment. And, but as I started going through this, and when I go through the text, I need to go through it like 40 or 50 times because I don't see things quickly enough. And I would invite you to learn to do the same. The more you go through it, the more I started to do this, I started to catch the depths of the struggle, the pain that God was aware of that was in his people. He, he talks about, and I'm not going to say verse, but I'm just going to go through and pop through it. He says, uh, he talks about their cry of panic, their terror, they have no peace. Verse 6, I'll read it. It says, now look and see, can a man bear a child? The answer is obviously No. He says, why then do I see every man with his hands on his stomach like a woman in labor and every face turned pale? The people were in intense struggles, intense physical struggles in that day. He talks about the yoke that was on their neck, the bonds that, that bound them. He talks about later in verse 12 that your hurt is incurable, your group wound is grievous, 13 uh, no one upholds your cause. There's no medicine for your wound. No healing for you. All of your lovers have forgotten you. They care nothing for you. Your guilt is great. Your sins are flagrant. 15, you're hurt. Your pain is incurable. Your guilt is great. Your sins are flagrant. 17, you were called an outcast. And as I started going through that, isn't that the nature of our world in which we live? People feel like they don't fit. They feel like they're outcasts. People have been wounded in soul in a way that there's no salve for the wounds. There's nothing that can be said. There's no doctor that can prescribe the thing that can fix the wounds that have been opened up in the hearts of men and women. It cannot be anesthetized with drugs, alcohol, or relationships with other people. There is nowhere else to turn that can solve the problem. People have forgotten you. People that care nothing of you. Can you start to feel the pain that God has, in some cases, inflicted upon his people? For their willing rejection of him because of their sins are flagrant. But he begins with the passage to say, I'm going to save you. I'm going to bring you back in. And then it's also compacted within the text. This is going to happen. I'm going to take that yoke of trouble off of you. I'm going to heal your wounds. I'm going to save you, verse 11. Verse 17, I'll restore health to you and your wounds I will heal here because... They called you an outcast. 
saying, Zion, for whom no one cares. What he's talking about here is, I'm going to change something. And our world right now is living through a time, there's nobody can cure it. All we can do is complain loudly at the situation. What's going to cure the souls of our country, of our, of our town, of the people that are hurting? What's the cure? What's going to change it? I got to tell a story about somebody, and I didn't anticipate telling this story, but I think recently there was an election, and J.D. Vance was elected, I believe, to office. All I know is that years ago, I heard J.D. Vance speak in Milwaukee, and he made a statement that stunned me even to this day. I can remember it exactly. Because the city of Milwaukee is a disaster. The schools are a disaster. Uh, the, the crime is rampant. It's a, not a pleasant place, by and large. And so we're in this large group of people, and J.D. Vance was kind of talking about his book, and then they gave a Q&A after. He says, okay, they said, okay, tell us, what's going to solve the problem for the youth in our city and the, and, the, and the struggles that they're going through? And he says, well, since I'm not running for office back in that day, he says, I'm just going to tell you what I think. He says, the only solution for the trouble in Milwaukee and the youth and the crime and all of this dysfunction is the church. Only the church has the answer to change the hearts of people. Only the church has the moral fabric and foundation to change what people need changed. And of course, that brought some displeasure from the people that didn't buy the church thing. But the truth of the matter is, what God is saying here is saying, listen, I know your pain. I know your dysfunction. And, and if you look out there about 200 miles, you see that little blip out there? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to heal it. I'm going to cure it. I'm going to take the pain and the loss and, the, and the, the fear and the travail and the fact that you feel like nobody cares about you in this whole wide world, and I'm going to cure it. I'm, I'm going I'm to save you. Well, it seems kind of trite as they're marching off into captivity, doesn't it? He says, no, I'm going I'm to come and save you. I'm going to come and get you, and I'm going to drag you back into the land, and you're going to be grateful, and we're going to be close again. He talks about it over and again, the use of the word, I'm going to save you, I'm going to save you, I'm going to save you. There's a couple pieces in here, if you do a little study on your own, that I think are are necessary to understand that this has not transpired yet today. Yes, God brought them back 70 years later in part, a very small part. And they lived in the land, but not under the fullness of the promise that's given here. So if you want to see the fullness of this promise being fulfilled, you got to go to the Revelation. you got to go to see where God is dragging His people back from all the tribes of Israel back into the land as believers. And they are going to be coming together. You're going to see that in verse 7. Alas, the day is so great, there's none like it. Reiterated in Matthew 24 and 25, this great day that's never been before is a time of distress for Jacob, time of Jacob's trouble. That's the time of the tribulation. That's the time when God's going to tribulate the world to the point and he'll save his people out of it, particularly Israel. That's unique. Verse 21 is unique. When he talks about saving then he says, and, and again, this is just that little mountain out in the distance. He's just giving them little bits and pieces that they can see from afar. And from afar, he says, when he talks about saying them, he says, their prince shall be one of themselves. Their ruler shall come out from their midst. And that was critical because the kings were getting stripped out of the country. Remember the promise to David? You're always going to have somebody that I will put on the throne forever. David gets the throne. David's line gets the throne of Israel. And they're all going to be gone and everybody's going to be sitting there scratching their head like they all got took into captivity. They all got put in chains. They all got murdered or whatever. How can this be? And he's saying, look, and the prince, when he comes, he's going to be one of you. He's going to come out of your midst. And I will make him draw near and he shall approach me. For who uh, would dare of himself to approach me, declares the Lord. Good point. Did Saul have the luxury of approaching the Lord. No. Remember he's going to go to battle. And the prophet's supposed to come. And help him go. And offer a sacrifice. And go before the Lord. 
And the prophet doesn't show, and the prophet doesn't show, and Saul's starting to get worried, and the people are, the soldiers are starting to get nervous and starting to panic. And he says, I gotta, we got to talk to the Lord about this before we go into battle. And the prophet doesn't show. And so what does Saul do? Yeah, Saul approaches the Lord. Something that he isn't allowed to do. And as he starts to offer the sacrifice, the prophet shows up and says, what are you doing? What are you doing? You, you the prince, the, the king, you don't have the authority to approach God. And it cost him the kingdom. Kings didn't get the luxury. They got to go to temple like everybody else in worship. They didn't get to go and approach the high priest once a year got to go and approach. But in this case, he's saying, wait, wait. You see that mountain out there? This thing that you, look, you think it looks small from here. But I can tell you, in that time, there's a prince going to come from the family here, he would say. And he's going to approach God. Who can do that? Well, only somebody who's special can do that. You'd have to go back all the way to Melchizedek, a king priest who had the authority to do that which the book of Hebrews talks about, he's going to come out and he's going to approach me. That's the mountain that he's talking about. Something different, something like you've never seen, bigger than has been described in Scripture to, to this point is showing up. Then it goes on to say, as he is expounding on this idea, he says, and you're going to be my people and I will be your God. Relationship of a new kind is being presented. Yeah, I know we were God's people, but we, we despised it. We flopped around, fought against it, hated it, sacrificed to everything but God. And he says, well, it's going to be different. You're going to be my people, and I'm going to be your God. And he says in verse 24, fierce anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and accomplished the intentions of his mind. Oh, and by the way, in the latter days, it says you'll understand this. When you get closer to that mountain, when you get closer to that, 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 that monstrosity of truth that I'm going to present to you, then you're going to start to understand it. God's going to execute his plan. Verse 31, I mean, chapter 31, verse 1, and at that time declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the clans of Israel. We're back to now this encompassing peace. And they shall be my people. Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. When Israel sought for rest, the Lord appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. Now we're seeing the why. Why is God even doing this? Why is God even saying, you know, that, that mountain in the distance that you see just a little bit of? There's a reason why I'm showing you that. I'm showing you that. Because I have loved you with an uncompromising, everlasting love. I'm showing you that because I have continued in my faithfulness from Abraham on. I am faithful to show you that. Again, I will build you and you shall be built, O virgin Israel. Again, you shall adorn yourself with tambourines and you shall go forth in the dance of the merrymakers, and you shall plant vineyards in the mountains of Samaria, and the planters shall plant and enjoy the fruit. Anybody grow grapes? I don't see many hands here. There's a few. Does it take a minute to get a grape thing established, a little, little uh, orchard or vineyardy thing? It does. It takes years, actually. I, I, I grew up on a farm that direction, and... Uh, and uh, Years after we left the farm and gone off to Alaska, you go back and, you know, it would be standing, it would, would be the grape arbor there. It would still be tied up. It takes years to build. When he says you're going to build, do put grapes or, or uh, vineyards in it, that takes time. It's very tangible. I want you to, to get the feeling that this is a concrete and a literal promise that's going on. He's not saying, you know, see that mountain out there? That's it's just heaven, you know. When you go through the pain of this whole life and you die, I'm going to drag you to heaven and it's going to be all glorious. That's not what he's saying there. He's talking literally, I'm going to take you back and plant you in the land. I'm going to 
plant you there, and you're going to plant vineyards and crops and stuff. It's going to be very, he's talking about a literal returning of the people. For in that day, the watchman will call to the hill country of Ephraim, arise and let us go to Zion to the Lord our God. Another little interesting piece of that thing, you can't see at a distance. If you know where Ephraim is related in the nations and and the division of the land, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but when, when Joshua brought the people into the land, remember they had to conquer the land and drive the nations out and then they divided it up and given it to this tribe, that tribe, this tribe, that tribe, right? To understand where Ephraim and Manasseh, and Ephraim and Manasseh were special because they were sons of Joseph, right? Joseph didn't get just the tribe of Joseph. He got Ephraim and Manasseh, right? They're to the north. They're the north of Jerusalem. They are the area of what you would call Samaria. And when they had this, this, this bloody civil war, Ephraim went north. And they created their own space of worship. It went all the way until Jesus met the woman at the well, right? What did he say? She says, okay, where am I supposed to worship? Here in Samaria or down in Jerusalem? The battle was still on. Where do you worship? He's saying when the time has come and you get to that that mountain of truth, you're going to understand that the people from Ephraim, the Samaritan area, they're going to come back down to Jerusalem where they were intended by God from the beginning to worship. It's going to be a complete restoration of that. For thus says the Lord, sing aloud with gladness, Jacob, and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Chief of nations? For the greatest nation on earth? Well, you'd have to go back to Deuteronomy and see that the promise, that mountain you're looking at, is is grabbing the promise of you become the greatest nation on earth. We'll be exactly as God had promised. Give praise and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring from them the north country and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth. Among them, the blind, the lame, the pregnant women, and she who is in labor together, a great company, and they shall return here. And I thought that's an interesting verse. Why is he saying that you're going to bring the blind and the lame and the pregnant and even the gal who's in labor. Now, we've had a few children in our family. And uh, I can vaguely remember uh, the times when my wife were giving birth. I do remember, but I think she remembers it more keenly than I. But I don't think travel was part of the plan. I don't think there was an interest at that point in time to lay. Hey, why don't you say we take a little vacation and we're going to jump in the car and drive to Florida? No, that's not happening. So why is he saying that? And I think what he's saying is in the day when this t- transpires, when you come to this mountain of truth, you're going to see that everybody that wouldn't necessarily come to this place, who wouldn't necessarily have the capacity, poor people, Blind people don't travel well. I mean, today it's a little different. But in those days, I imagine it was different. We're saying the people that wouldn't necessarily go are going to go. The ones that would be unexpected will show up. And I'm just going to take a sideline here. Who did you see? Obviously, the big mountain is the coming of the Savior, right? The salvation that would be in Christ. Who did... Jesus particularly attract the blind people, the lame, the, the, those who were poor in spirit. And he called them to himself and he spit in the ground and he healed their eyes and he opened. He, he, that's where it landed there. And he, this is what the prophet is saying. You know that, that truth that's coming, it's going to be unsuspecting. It's not going to be like you think it's going to happen. They're going to come back. The ones that are coming, you're not going to expect. With weeping they shall come. With pleas of mercy I will lead them back. I will make them walk by brooks of water in a straight path, and they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare the coastlands far away. He who has scattered Israel will gather him and will keep him as a, shep- as a shepherd keeps his flock. You can almost hear the 23rd Psalm in that, can't you? The Lord is my shepherd. I'm going to take care of them. I'm going to lead them by still waters. I'm going to care for them. 
Verse 11. Oh, I got to back up to verse 10. This is too good here. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations. Declare it in the coastlands far away. If you understand the nature of what that term nations mean, the word is goyim. The goyim were the non-Jews. To the Jews, it's a spit word. Declare to the nations the mountain that's coming. Declare to the nations that God is going to do it. Tell everybody about this, that God keeps his people. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob and redeemed him from a hand too strong. What do you mean he's redeemed them? He's bought them. You want to know what the mountain is? It's redemption. It's being bought back from this sinful, wretched mess that they had lived in for the past, well, since basically Moses, right? Before that was even worse. And they shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion, and they shall be radiant with goodness, grain and wine and oil, and the young of the flock and the herd, and their life shall be like a watered garden, and they shall languish no more. Sounds lovely. And then shall the young women rejoice and dance, and the young men and the old shall be merry, and I shall turn their mourning into joy, and I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. Oh, you want to know another little part about that, that mountain that you can't really get in hand? You know this brokenness in your heart, the sorrow that you don't think is ever going to leave? It's going to be taken care of. The morning that doesn't seem to want to go, he's going to replace it with joy. How does that happen? I will feast the soul of the priests with abundance. The people will be satisfied with my goodness. I love that statement. For the first time, Israel will be satisfied with God's goodness. They haven't been satisfied yet. They were always looking for something else other rather than God. When this comes, when this truth comes, they'll be satisfied with my goodness, declares the Lord. Thus says the Lord, a voice, and this is interesting, the voice is heard in Rama, lamentation and bitterness and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. As I studied this, going off into captivity there was a point of embarkation where they would drag the slaves and the, the the captives from war before they sent them up the fertile crescent over and over into babylon and the point of that leaving was rama and that's where they would take the slaves and moms and dads would be separated with their from their children forever And the weeping was evident. I find it interesting that they talk about the weeping at Rama, but it also mentions Rachel is weeping. And I'm like, that's interesting. Rachel, yeah, I get it. Rachel uh, was Jacob's wife who bore jo Joseph. Oh, and Benjamin. Remember what happened? You do, don't you? Joseph went out to the field. To see and help his brothers as dad instructed. And the brothers took him. Threw him in a pit. Took his fancy robe. Covered it with blood and took it home. And we don't hear what Rachel said that day. I have a good idea what Rachel said that day. And it wasn't even words. It's pulling the idea of Rachel weeping over losing Joseph. But the trick is, though she went to the grave, Joseph wasn't lost. And though the people would go off into captivity from Rama, see that out there? They're not really lost. It's not over. They're going to come back. They're going to come back. Jump forward to the gospel, and what do you see in Matthew? The angel warns Joseph and Mary. Get out of town because this is going to go bad. And they grab Jesus and they go to Egypt. 
And Herod goes around and he slaughters the boys. And it fulfilled what it says in Jeremiah. The cries from Ramah. But was it over when Jesus left town? No. I think this is a profound use of the scriptures to show that God had a plan. That even in the, the worst possible imagination of things, God wasn't done with his people. And the plan is greater and it keeps getting larger and larger. And he talks about there's a, there's a hope for your future. Your children will come back. I've heard Ephraim grieving. You've disciplined me and I was disciplined like an untrained calf. Bring me back that I might be restored for you are the Lord my God. And part of that mountain that we're looking at has to do with repentance and turning to the Lord. John the Baptist would land on the scene and he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Part of that, this great mountain of truth that's coming is repentance. So we're getting bits and pieces of what this is going to be. And he talks on about how they were wicked and how they owned it. We're going to have to jump ahead just for time today. Verse 21, set up road markers for yourself. Make for yourself guideposts. Consider well the highway, the road by which you went. Return, O virgin Israel, return to your cities. Prepare for restoration. Set your heart right for what's coming, the restoration that will come. Verse 22, I have no idea what it means. I'll read it to you just because it's, it's completely got me flummoxed. How long you waver, O faithful daughter, for the Lord has created a new thing on the earth. A woman encircles a man. What? I don't know what it means. I looked at a whole bunch of commentaries. I looked at, I talked, guess what? Nobody seems to really know what that means. All I know is what something that's out there is something new. Something different is going to happen. He's created something entirely new. So everything you've had to this point, Israel, you don't know anything like what's coming in the future. You don't have a clue of what's coming. Something that 2,600 years later, we still don't know what it means exactly. And then the Lord of hosts says, God of Israel, once more you shall use these words on the land of Judah. And the cities will restore their fortunes. Lord, the Lord bless you, O habitation of righteousness, O holy hill. He's saying, this is what you're going to say. But in verse 27, this is what you're not going to say. You're not going to say these things. The father of eating sour grapes and the children's teeth are on edge. You see, children would be born in captivity, far from God, far from the temple, far from worship. And I'm sure they would sit around on a Saturday afternoon, Sabbath, twiddling their thumbs, saying, if it wasn't for dad and granddad and them being knuckleheads, you know, we wouldn't be here. You know how it goes, right? Dads and granddads look at you, you know, it's like, yeah, we messed it up sometimes, didn't we? You're not going to say that anymore, he said. And in, in this new thing coming, you're not going to say that because everybody's going to Stand on their own. Everybody's going to stand. For everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Each person who eats sour grapes, his teeth will be set on edge. Interesting. So what is coming? What is coming? And then he starts at the next verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. With the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Oh, what's coming down the road is a new covenant. Not like the one that we had before. This is not like any other covenant that was ever made. And so I, I went back and, you know, I like the covenants and we've kicked that around for a long time. But I found it quite interesting, just the idea that we have, uh, we have our Bibles divided in two pieces, Right? We have the old, what do we call it? Testament, right? And we have the New Testament. Why do we call it the Testament? What does that mean? Why do we call it the old and the new Testament? Well, Testament was just Latin for covenant. 
That's all it was. When you had the old covenant and then the new covenant. That's really what it should be called. Let's turn to your old covenant and see this. But turn to the new covenant to see this. That's what he's saying. I'm going to give you a new covenant that's not like the old covenant. And I had a whole bunch of stuff on covenant. It's like six pages. And I'm all prepared to go through it. However, um, just, just to suffice it to say that the new covenant that he is talking about here was predicted, was planned, was, well, let's just see what it is and then we'll move. The new covenant is not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of Egypt. So we know what it's not like. It's not like the Mosaic Covenant required all the stuff. If you wanted to worship God, you had to do all the things. You had to go shed some blood if you wanted to worship God, period. It didn't work otherwise. We don't do that sort of thing, do we here? You don't have to come in here and wring the head off of a dove or cut the throat of a sheep or something so you could come in here today to worship. You didn't get that luxury back in the day. Something had to bleed and die for you to come in and worship. But under the new covenant, the blood has been shed. So you get to come in. Think about that for a second. It's not going to be like that one. It's going to be quite different than that. He says this, I was like a husband, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declared the Lord. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people, indicating intimate relationship. And what God's principles will now land inside of them. As opposed to written on tablets of stone. How does something get on the inside of people? With this, this, new, this new thing he's doing. How does it get in here? Or inside of them? Because it's going to be inside of them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, Know the Lord for they shall all know me. How does that happen? Well, that's a big piece of the mystery. That was a huge mystery. Not until Acts chapter 2 would you see the answer to the mystery. How does it go from the outside to the inside? And as they were in the upper room praying, the sound of a great wind came, right? And there was a scene to be fires, little tongues of fire on each of their heads. What's the implication of the fire on their heads? Well, if you want to know the guiding portion, what God did via the Holy Spirit when they come out of Egypt, right? A big pillar of fire. You followed the fire or the cloud and God led them every time. And now suddenly, each person has got a thing of fire. The Holy Spirit came upon them. And it was like, what's going on? And they're like, they're drunk. And they're like, no, it's too early for that. No, it, it, the Spirit of God, and they were, had no idea that God was going to take the truth, place it in the hearts of men. This is the new covenant. This is the giant mountain that you couldn't see from the distance. I'll be their God. They will be my people. And no one, no longer shall each person teach his brother, saying, know the Lord. All people know me. Romans chapter 8 says in this testifying, the Spirit of God will testify to your heart that you are sons of God. You don't need somebody to tell me that you're the son of God. You don't need somebody to say you were born into it. You need the Spirit of God tells your soul that you are the son of God or the daughter of God. That's different. From the least of them to the greatest. So it doesn't matter if you're the priest. Or the Levite, or the king, or somebody who had enough money that you could afford to study that. Everybody can get it. It's that blind and lame and pregnant and in labor. Those who you wouldn't, they all get it. Everybody 
gets it. And then he goes on to this, and this is the biggest piece. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. That's the great mountain. That's the great truth that rises up above all of it. Forgiveness of sin. You're not going to remember anymore. That changes the entirety corpus of worship. And that would be coming as well. And that was a problem for a bunch of them. And then he solidifies it with this. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that the waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then shall the offspring of Israel cease from being a nation before me forever. Oh, you know what I'm saying? He's saying, I'm going to make this covenant, and this covenant is so fixed. Go outside and watch the constellations. That's how firm it is. That's how permanent and eternal this promise is. Well, what if they don't do it right? What if they screw? sin and sin some more and then sin on top of that and then their kids do the same thing over and in what happens when that happens because you can see the questions coming verse 37 thus says the lord if heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below be explored then i will cast off all the offspring of israel for all that they have done declares the lord And therein lies the unconditional nature of the new covenant. It is eternal. It is conditioned only on the promise of God. On the, well, we're going to see the work of Christ. And then there's one more piece that goes with it. And this this one kind of confused me for a minute. Verses 38 through 40. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord. When the city shall be rebuilt for the tower uh, of the, for the Lord from the tower of Hananel, And the corner gate and the measuring line shall go out farther straight to the hill of Gareb. And they shall turn to Goa and the whole valley of the dead bodies and ashes and all the fields as far as the book of Kidron. To the corner of the horse gate toward the east shall be sacred to the Lord. And it shall not be plucked up or overthrown anymore forever. And I'm like, what? what's the point? Why did he have to give me all these measurements and stuff like that? What does he want us to know about that? I mean, I know it's kind of a shadow of what's coming, but what's the point? And I started thinking on that. And I was like, this is, this is really to add the, the concreteness to it, the literalness of this. This is going to be a literal city where Jesus is going to be, and it's going to be fixed forever. It's not some figurative restoration, and unfortunately, a bunch of theologians have done disservice to that. They have said that this is just heaven and Israel is gone and this whole thing is just kind of a figment of everybody's. It's just all kind of an erythral idea. No. It's literal. It's concrete. And then I started to ask the question. The question is this. What if it's true? What if this is true? What what if... What God said through Jeremiah is actually what he said it's going to be. That he is going to create a new covenant that is going to change the entirety of the relationship with man and God forever. Does that matter? Hebrews chapter 12 says this. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words that made the hearers beg that no further message be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given, quote, even if a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. He's taken them all the way back to their exit out of Egypt to the, when they came to the mountain and God said, I want to meet with you. I want to create this, this contract with you, this covenant with you. And they were so terrified with that that they come up to the mountain and it, and it shook and it, and it terrorized them. And they, they don't even want to go close. Moses, you go. He says, that's not the mountain you're coming to. That's not the mountain you're going to. They couldn't endure that. Verse 21, indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses says, I tremble with fear. You haven't come to that mountain. 
what mountain have you come to? But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who were enrolled in heaven, and to God, and to the judge of all, and the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. And to the sprinkled blood that speaks better than the word of the blood of, than the blood of Abel. You see... Jeremiah got to point to a mountain that was coming. And it was the true Mount Zion in heaven where the covenant would be built and the blood of Christ would be sprinkled forever for everyone who would. It's profound. In the middle of this horrible depressing book of Jeremiah, you see something so incredible. And then I started to put my feet, myself into the shoes of those who heard the prophecy. Oh, and they said, this could be true. And year would pass, and another year would pass, and then a decade would pass, and then a lifetime would pass, and a, then a century would pass, and a century would pass. And almost 600 years would go by. Israel was waiting, hoping, praying, wondering. What, was the promise real? What, what, what if it's true? What, is it true? Was what Jeremiah heard true? Is it going to be fulfilled? And then this little baby was born. This little baby was born. And the Christmas story is like the foothill of this giant mountain that was promised. This baby that we get to celebrate over the next weeks is this introduction to the greatest promise that has ever given mankind. The forgiveness of sins, the Spirit of God inside, joined in the heavenlies with this angels and God and all of that. We're, this is it. And if it's true, folks, if it's true, I invite you not to miss it. Don't miss it. It's too good. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. For your goodness to us and your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that even in the darkest of times through your prophet, Jeremiah. You pointed out what was coming and the goodness that would come through your son. I thank you for that. I pray that we would not miss it. And as we meditate on your new covenant today and as we go into the service of communion, I pray that we would uh, take one further look at that covenant and we would honor you for the blessings of your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. What a special time it is to take communion. And as I invite our deacons and our, our pastoral staff to come forward at this time. At Ebenezer, we believe that anyone can take communion that has a relationship with Jesus Christ. We believe that it's a time to remember what Christ did on the cross for us. At Christmas, we celebrate the birth of the Savior and what that means for a dark and fallen world, waiting for the Messiah to give this world light. Years later, we remember what Christ did for us on the cross and how that light can now shine in us and through us to a dark and fallen world today that desperately needs a Savior. From 1 Corinthians, we see what Paul says to the church in chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As we pass the bread, please spend some time in prayer asking God if there is anything between you and him. If so, spend time confessing to him. 
and then rest in the grace and forgiveness that he provides. Job, would you pray for the bread, please? Father God, we come before you today with a heart of thanksgiving. Lord, we're so thankful for what you did. You sent your son, Jesus, to live among us, to uh, die on that cross, bruised and broken, a death that was meant for us. We thank you for the new covenant through Jesus so that we could have right standing with you. We could be righteous before you, Father God. I think of David in Psalms 139 where he says, Search my heart, O God. Know my thoughts. Know my innermost being. If there's anything in our lives, Lord, that's not pleasing to you, I pray as we hold the bread in our hands, signifying your body bruised and broken, that we would confess that sin and that we would be made righteous before you, Father God. We thank you for this gift, the atoning blood in your body that was broken for us. In Jesus' name, amen.
please partake with us if you haven't done so already. In the same way, he took the cup after, saying, after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Please hold the cup and let us partake together. The story 
until Christ comes. At this time, I'd like to ask our deacons and pastoral staff to come up on stage, and our church staff, along with Pastor Dick and Miss Cheryl. Uh, we just want to take a few moments real quick to thank them. Um, some of you don't know that I grew up in Williamstown, Ohio, one of the first missionaries we heard at the church that I grew up in was Dick and Cheryl Potter. And so I've known them, I think, since I was a smaller boy than I am now. And uh, I always enjoyed it when they came because you got to see a slideshow and there was finger food. And it was good stuff about this exotic land called the Philippines. Uh, when I was uh, about 10 years ago, I suffered some a depression, which I've shared with you before, and my boss at the time, Youth for Christ, Don Leader, asked that I go see Dick Potter, and I did, and I wouldn't be who I am today without Dick, and so I just want to thank Dick and Cheryl for their years of service, and we're going to have Miss Kathy Brown and <laughs> Pastor Jim, and he's already got his Kleenexes, and, and Pastor Nick share briefly, and then join us for some snacks afterwards. All right. All right, well, uh, Dick and Cheryl, why don't you... Out here. We need to see your faces and all that, yes. And uh, we want to uh, congratulate you on your retirement. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's about the fifth time that uh, <laughs> you've come to this juncture, but I think yeah. this is all real. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyways, uh, I've had the privilege of uh, serving here at Ebenezer for 13 years with you. And uh, when I thought about that time and who you are, this isn't just about 13 years, it's about who you are. I came up with three words. Uh -oh. <laughs> There'll be a test later <laughs> on. Okay. Anyways, three words. The first word is sensitive. Yes. <laughs> Dick is a. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. You always need to have that stocked uh, on your on your desk and all that. So, anyways, Dick is sensitive, and that and that's a good trait because he understands. Um, when there's loss, when there's grief, uh, Dick feels that grief with that person who's grieving. And it makes you a great counselor, it really does. Thank you. So, yeah, keep the clean nice <laughs> system. Yes, the, the, the second word that uh, I th when I think about you is the word servant. You are, you are a, a servant. Uh, when we think of Jesus, uh, you know, I, I came not to be served, but, yes. but uh, to Thank you. serve. Thank you. And you have modeled that. And I have seen time and time again, uh, you don't have to be asked. You see something that needs to be done, and you'll do it. From picking up a chair, a tape, cleaning a table, whatever it is. Uh, a phone call to go, a hospital visit, the drop of a hat, you, you go. The servant. And the last one is, and I think this is probably really the most important, is that you're a student. And by, by student, and that's really a great word for the word disciple, is uh, an apprentice, a, a pupil, a student. And you're, you're a student of Jesus and his word. And uh, being you. around you, I know that content-wise, <laughs> content-wise, you, you uh, study the scriptures, yeah. and you're always going to be prepared. You have more than enough to teach. It's always a good trait of yours. So anyways, those, those three words, sensitive, yeah. servant, and a student. That's that's it keeps it simple. Three S's. So, yeah, so there, you go. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. My pleasure. It was my privilege to serve alongside Pastor Dick for 18 years. I know. I know. <laughs> he was a welcome addition to the church staff in 2004 and brought a much needed and utilized ministry to the church family and to the community as well. We'll never know how many persons have been blessed by Dick through God over the years. His listening ear and kind demeanor brought comfort and encouragement to many through his years of counseling ministry and as a faithful Sunday school teacher. We worked closely through the Stephen Ministry Program through training of Stephen Ministers, administration, and we were touched to witness the real assistance it brought to those going through tough times. Dick's characteristic trait of deep empathy has carried through to the Grief Share program he spearheaded during this past year. But the times I'll remember best are the many visits we made together to our dear church family members in their homes, in hospitals, and at nursing homes. 
In addition, planning funerals together along with the rest of the staff were always such special times of remember, remembrance and thankfulness to the Lord. Dick's tender heart and obvious care for others made him a special and one-of-a-kind person. Dick, may God continue to bless you in whatever and wherever he leads you and Cheryl in the coming years. You will be deeply missed. Thank you. I know you are. <laughs> Me too. Do I get a couple of words? Would you like to say anything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, jump yeah, in. Yeah, I, get, <laughs> I was just thinking, 41 years ago this year, I was in Dallas, Texas, Cheryl and I were living there, and I was on the phone talking to the pastor here at Ebenezer. That was Pastor Burton Reed. We were to do an internship for nine months before we went overseas with the mission that we went to the Philippines with. I tried to get out of it, but they wouldn't let me out of it. And I'd never heard of the Mennonite church in the sense of knowing what they do. So as I was talking with P Pastor Reed, I said, now, Pastor Reed, is my wife going to have to wear one of those beanies on her head when she comes to the Mennonite church? I didn't know a Mennonite from an Amish from whatever. And, uh, but that was 41 years ago. We come out to do our nine-month internship. It turned out to be two years. Mm. And it was the time that we began to really connect with the family here. And, but, but, but you have been with us through thick and thin, 20 years on a mission field, an opportunity to bring us on staff so we could minister with you over these years. So we just want to say thank you. We love you. And we're still going to be here. Still <laughs> be <with you. laughs> Very good. Oh, yeah, thank you. Oh, absolutely. I just have a couple things to say about the man that I affectionately call Colonel Potter. Um, and and I, we said that flippantly, but um, I, would, I would call him one of uh, a true warrior poets. Um, the man, former Marine, if there's ever such a thing as a former Marine, he's always a Marine. Um, from the moment I walked through the door uh, a year ago, um, You've worked for my success, and you've helped me to that end. I do confess I was a little suspicious, uh, particularly about the weak coffee and the French vanilla creamer <laughs> that he always has in hand. I'm like, um, but I've grown to appreciate that. Um, I'm going to miss our prayer times before service. And your quick smile and your thoughtful answers, he's helped me. Gentle patience that he's had with me is matters a lot because I'm usually going about 100 miles an hour, and, uh, and he helps me slow down. I'm going to miss your constant encouragement uh, and the guidance that has been so helpful over this past year. Uh, to, to confirm the idea of the warrior poet, one day I walk into the BFR, into the weight room, and, and there's this guy who's like grinding out the squats, you know, he's on the squat machine, and he's pounding it out with like, and just see this intensity. And, and, and he turns and he sees me and he's like a Labrador retriever. He just smiles as if I have the happiest thing he could do to see me at that moment. Um, but that, that's, that's him, the tender-hearted colonel. Thanks for helping so many, including myself, thrive. Thank you for your counsel, your heart of hurting people. Look forward to your continuing with grief share. Uh, may the Lord bless you with a joyous and, and pleasant time, Cheryl in your retirement. We love you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Not quite. I'm going to pray. I'd like to, I'd like to pray, and then we're going to have uh, food that's set up, I believe, out in that hallway there, so we can have a little time to kind of, uh, yeah, uh, spend time with you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Dick and Cheryl. Thank you for their uh, journey with us. Amen that they have given themselves to us, and we have been the rich recipients of that blessing, Lord. I just pray uh, that you would bless them for their service. I pray that their retirement years would be joyous, that they would be active, that they would continue to serve in the way that you've called them forward, Lord. pray you bless them in this time. Bless this congregation as we spend some time together eating and just enjoying uh, their presence. In your name we do pray. Amen. Amen. All right.
Thank you. Thank you much, and we love